Skeletor to King Randor! Skeletor to King Randor! Come in, you royal boob! It's not nice to call people names. Who are you, woman? The name's She-Ra. She-Ra! This is my friend, She-Ra. I am She-Ra! In the early 1980s, the Mattel Toy Company had a huge success with their Masters of the Universe toy line. The toys were so successful with young boys, it led to comic book adaptations, storybooks, and before long, an animated series. Produced by Filmation Studios, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe told the story of Prince Adam, who through a magic power sword, transformed into He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. He-Man protected the planet Eternia from the evil of Skeletor. The series began running in national syndication in 1983 and produced 130 episodes. Wanting to reach out to a female demographic, Filmation president Lou Scheimer approached Mattel about creating a female counterpart to He-Man named She-Ra, Princess of Power. The creative staffs of both Filmation and Mattel collaborated on the backstory for She-Ra and her alter ego, Adora. Adora was to be Prince Adam's twin sister, who was kidnapped as a baby by the evil Hordak. Hordak brought Adora to Etheria, a planet under his fascist rule. It is through He-Man that Adora discovers her true destiny and with her own magical sword transforms into She-Ra and leads a band of rebels who fight for freedom against Hordak's regime. Like He-Man, She-Ra's earliest adventures took place within mini-comics that were packaged with the toys. While He-Man's comic adventures dealt with good versus evil in action-packed adventures, the She-Ra comics were geared towards a more stereotypically feminine domain. Instead of Hordak, She-Ra's mini-comic adversary was always Catra, referred to on the toy packages as the Jealous Beauty. The mini-comics usually focused on Catra trying to plunder or steal something. Though greedy, Catra could hardly be seen as dangerous, and therefore She-Ra seemed much less powerful than He-Man. The Filmation cartoons version of She-Ra was much more equitable to He-Man. In many ways, Hordak could be seen as an even more powerful and capable adversary than He-Man's Skeletor. Instead of being a criminal trying to take over the planet, as Skeletor was, Hordak was already the ruler of the planet. In a sense, She-Ra and her allies were the outlaws fighting for freedom against the oppressive dictatorship of Hordak. Now that we have looked into She-Ra's background, I would like to show you why I think she as an artifact is a good representation of several types of feminism. According to Judith Lorber, liberal feminism aims to make all aspects of life more gender neutral. Lorber points to several causes of gender inequality that liberal feminism aims to change. The main ones that relate to She-Ra are gendered socialization of children and the divisions of work into men's jobs and women's jobs. She-Ra the toy was able to break through a bit of this gender separation. To understand this better, we must first look at the assumed differences between a doll and an action figure. According to Anna Wagner Ott's analysis of gender identity through doll and action figure politics in art education, manufacturers who make toys make gender. They produce images to be used by specific audiences and to be played with in specific ways. For most children, dolls such as Barbie are strictly for girls. They have rooted hair that you can brush and cloth outfits that you can change. Their accessories, according to Wagner Ott, may have taught girls how to beautify themselves, how to care for baby dolls, and how to play house. Action figures, on the other hand, are usually equipped with an action feature, and their accessories tend to be weapons instead of articles of clothing that lead towards adventure play instead of fashion. Though the toy version of She-Ra was still referred to as a doll on the packaging, the She-Ra figures usually had an action feature similar to the He-Man figures, along with rooted hair and changeable clothing. She-Ra figures included a brush along with a weapon. While I noted earlier that the toy version of She-Ra took a lot of the emphasis off of action and adventure, I could also argue that she the She-Ra toy line was able to blur the lines between doll and action figure. She-Ra was enough of an action figure to make it okay for boys to play with, while she also brought interest in adventure to girls. In Jackie Marsh's article, But I Want to Fly Too, Girls and Superhero Play in the Infant Classroom, Marsh argues that many girls do not pursue active roles in adventure play due to the lack of representation. Good girls simper and whimper, and, if they are pretty enough, gain the romantic attention from the heroes. Marsh also adds, this lack of interest may be related to the fact that the female superheroes are generally located in patriarchal sites of power struggles. Marsh's analysis showed 
that when a group of young boys and girls were allowed to play in an area where they were shown images and text that portrayed women in active adventure roles, the girls' interest in adventure play gradually increased and even surpassed that of the boys. The experiment shows how children can learn and respond to gender roles based on the media they are exposed to. In the world of She-Ra, Hordak is the patriarchal dictator, however the rightful ruler of the planet is Queen Angela. We never hear of a king, only that Queen Angela ruled the planet before it was overrun by the Horde. As queen of this kingdom, I demand you surrender Castle Brightmoon to me. This exemplifies one of the many ways Shira shows women in strong roles, thus countering the idea of male jobs and female jobs. Shira also serves as an artifact of radical feminism. Lorber points to patriarchal oppression of women in various social institutions, as well as the objectification of women's bodies, as sites of inequality that radical feminism seeks to rectify. Patriarchy is never mentioned by name in She-Ra's world, but the Princess of Power still fights it in many radical feminist ways. Where the He-Man toy line consisted almost exclusively of male figures, the She-Ra toy line was the exact opposite. With the exception of Bo and Cowl, all the figures in the line were female. Although Hordak was in the mythology of the She-Ra line, he and the male members of the Horde were technically part of the He-Man toy line. The characters in the She-Ra line existed in a world without patriarchy. The women were never shown as subjects of any masculine force. Even Katra, who was a member of the Horde, did not receive orders from Hordak. In the mini-comic adventures, she had full autonomy. In the cartoon, the members of the Rebellion, both male and female, fought against Hordak's oppressive rule and did so under the leadership of Adora. Never in the series did anyone question or voice concern over having a female leader. These images fight against the legitimization of oppression of women. Like Queen Angela, Adora is a celebrated leader in a position of power who is capable of strength, intelligence, and compassion. Some may argue that objectification occurs with She-Ra's clothing. This is a double bind that She-Ra and most other female superheroes face as artifacts of feminism, meaning it is a situation she cannot win. If her body is covered, she runs the risk of showing that femininity is something shameful that needs to be hidden. But showing her body could make her a sexual object. I counter this double bind by pointing out that She-Ra is actually more covered than He-Man. Her body may be an idealized image, but no more than her male counterparts. I personally feel that the designers were able to be successful at creating a look that strikes a good balance. They celebrate her body without too much emphasis on it. Some may think that the fact that Adora only learns her true destiny with the help of a man undercuts her power as a woman. I challenge that assumption with a postmodern feminist argument. Lorber writes that equality will come when the sexes, sexualities, and genders are not played against each other. He-Man's gender should not take away from She-Ra. In fact, He-Man received his power from a female character, the Sorceress. The He-Man She-Ra world does not focus on gender enough to make this a real problem. However, I would also like to point out that in the toy line, She-Ra's sword is much smaller than He-Man's, possibly making it look less powerful, but in the cartoon series, the swords are the same size, showing the two are on equal footing when it comes to power. These examples show how She-Ra is a useful artifact of feminism, but now let's look at her as a positive image that goes beyond feminism to a positive humanist icon, and specifically her importance to the LGBT community. She-Ra is able to serve as a metaphor for real-life situations, just like most fiction. Unlike She-Ra, we can't communicate with animals. It's all right. They don't want to harm us. They want to help in the battle against the Horde. But we can use our language to spread ideas and communicate our messages through peaceful discourse. We also may not be able to have magic healing powers. Swift Wind! Shira! Oh, Swift Wind's dying. I can feel the pain. Can it be? For the honor of Grayskull. Thank you, my friend. But we can try our best to help those who need it. It would be difficult and exhaustive to look at all of the qualities that make She-Ra a positive image, but let's look at her compassion and her confidence as a character facing many challenges. She-Ra shows compassion even to her enemies. In the episode, My Friend, My Enemy, Hordak is poisoned by Skeletor and Katra. She-Ra discovers that the only cure for Hordak is to have someone who cares about him cry for him. She-Ra never even questions her duty to help him. She-Ra struggles to bring him to his former teacher, Noah. But even after the long journey, Noah refuses to cry for someone as evil as Hordak. Once he was powerful, now he's alone, abandoned, unloved. It's sad, and it's wrong. Help somebody! She-Ra, you did it! Your tears 
cured Hordak. You've helped me to remember what true kindness and understanding are. Shira not only shows her own compassion, but inspires it in Noah and the audience. I'll stop her. All right, that's it. No one around here knows how to treat a lady. Shira's unwavering confidence is also an important attribute. Thanks for the compliment, Fang. <laughs> you can't do this to me. Funny, I thought I just did it. Bye now. Although it is often displayed with a bit of sarcastic humor, Shira and Adora both face challenges in ways that can inspire children and adults. Oh, don't fall over yourselves getting to me. And if we chuckle a bit. Is this how you get girls to fall for you, Hordak? All the better. To show how Shira has a positive message for LGBT youth, I'm going to focus on the episode Stone and the Sword. During a battle with Hordak, Shira's sword is damaged. Without this stone, my sword has no powers. I can't become Shira. Adora must travel to the underworld to seek the help of the first ones in order that she can once again become Shira and rescue her captured friend. Once Adora finally reaches the first one, they proclaim to her. You were brave to climb Sky Dancer. You were wise to use the shield to outrun the spike to ball. You were swift in escaping the cave-in, agile in avoiding the falling rocks of the forbidden corner, and brave to risk entering the cavern of fire. And you did all this for a friend. Are these not the qualities of Shira? Whereas Prince Adam's transformation is much more drastic, Adora basically becomes more of who she already is as She-Ra. This could be seen through an LGBT lens as a message that once we fully accept who we are, we will gain power. In a recent interview with Gay.net, voice actress Erica Scheimer spoke about She-Ra as a gay icon. I think she's a great feminist, frankly, and she carries on the tradition of Gloria Steinem. I think that it's appealing to all of us minorities out there. It's also the humanity of She-Ra. She's a real three-dimensional character with flaws. She's a superhero, but she's accessible, and I think because of that, her humanity, that she's stolen everybody's heart. In another He-Man, She-Ra related interview at Gay.net, Scott Knightlick, brand manager of the current Masters of the Universe Classics toy line said, When you are dealing with an empowered cast of characters possessing strength, courage, and determination, I can see how these characters would speak to young gay children in a positive way. Even though the show and toy line ended over two decades ago, Shira continues to resonate with fans of all ages, both new and old. She has transcended gender boundaries to become a relatable, positive role model for many of us. Shira, princess of power, 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 power.